yes or yeah of course yeah man right. okay wouldn't have it any other way <laughs> yeah. great we're now live streaming a warm welcome to everyone uh, good evening uh, to you it's wednesday 17th of march just gone past 7 p.m in the UK. My name is Dr. Fahim Shakur. I'm a GP and along with uh, Dr. Mehran Javid, consultant psychiatrist with the conveners of tonight's meeting. It's on leadership, a leadership masterclass, if you will, with three experts. Over the course of the next hour or so, we should hope to uh, go through different facets of leadership and get some lived experience and actual histories to actually uh, inculcate in our medical careers and for those of you with an interest in leadership. We have tonight J.S. Bamra, Anil Jain and Fazana Hussein. They are three doctors from three Three different disciplines but they all have key leadership positions uh, in the community and uh, my co-host Dr. Mehran Javid will explain their biographies in detail. For those of you who are just joining in, Dr. Hussain, one of our co-speakers will be coming along just a few minutes late uh, but if you do have any questions as I said please do not hesitate to write them in the chat box and uh, we will try and get them answered tonight. So everyone, sit back, relax, get a beverage of your choice uh, and enjoy the evening. I'll hand you over to Dr. Mehran Javid to formally introduce our guests. Uh, thank you, Fahim. And I'm really looking forward to the next hour discussion on leadership. Um, we've got three fantastic experts. Uh, and without further ado, let me start introducing um, Dr. Bamra. So I, I know JS um, professionally uh, for, for some time. We work in the same area. Um, and he's also a all day psychiatrist, just like myself. But as, as you may well know, um, he is chairman of the British Association of Physicians of Indian Origin, but he's also a writer, researcher, uh, and speaker. He has uh, a wealth of experience. Um, he's also the deputy chairman of the Board of Science and BMA. So he's, he's got numerous hats, um, but you know, I'll, I'll let him talk about the, the importance of leadership and what we need to be aware of as individuals. So over to you, JS. Thank you, Mehran. Thank you, Raim. I think this is a great pleasure, really. Where would I be? Uh, and we've got a problem now because we've got to beat the clock. We've got to be getting out of here in time for you guys to, to actually savor the, uh, the delights of uh, Master Chef, isn't it? <laughs> yes. uh, I thought rather than give a long talk, I did prepare slides about leadership. Rather than give uh, a long talk, I thought it would be good if we can make it interactive because I'm really looking forward to my two course speakers who have a huge amount of experience. So, and so do put, please put in the questions in the chat box. Um, now, so, um, well, leaders, you know, I, I would have said that um, when I was a medical student and I was a young lad growing up in East Africa, I wouldn't have thought that I would be in this position. So I, I've been very privileged in being able to be in a position where some people might say I'm a leader. I don't know. But, uh, uh, you know, you don't. And I was looking at this, you know, I don't know what you folks think. Are leaders born or are they bred? Uh, probably a little bit of both, but I suppose as psychiatrists, Mehran, we would understand that you have to have those personality traits or characteristics where you um, can uh, can influence uh, uh, debate and discussion. So, and there are different kinds of leaders. We've seen good leaders and we've seen bad leaders as well, uh, including in medicine. Unfortunately, we're not devoid of them. Um, so there are different powers that leaders uh, wield. So there's the legitimate power, which uh, your organization gives you, such as if you're the president of a college or the chair of an association or the medical director of a trust. So that's your legitimate power, which is invested in you. The other is your reward power, which is uh, given to senior managers that um, give them administrative authority to make all sorts of decisions and changes. There's the expert power, which a lot of you will have as specialist in your field, uh, which is really by your skills and knowledge, abilities, and previous experience. And there is the charisma power, which of course our hosts have lots and lots of bags of charisma power. So charisma power obviously is winning the hearts over the minds. Uh, and certainly I would say in everything you require the charisma, even if you have you see some great leaders, but they have no charisma. So uh, they don't, they're not in a position to make changes happen as, as they should. And there's a referent power, which is the reason 
that you're, such as being in government or being in a, in a organization, being in the GMC, you have reference power, which is invested in you through being in that organization. And of course, information power is where you have uh, probably more pertaining to academics. So I think, I think leadership comes into the context of all of that. And leadership, um, we've been doing a series of things in Tapio about um, differential attainment. Why do BME doctors, immigrant doctors, migrant doctors, why do they not fare so well? And you will know that famously we took the RCGP to court uh, in 2012, 14. Uh, we lost that case. It was about differential attainment in the RCGP exam, but the judge said that we had won a moral victory. So legally we lost it, but moral victory it was. And so I think it's very important in, as medical professionals that we're able to understand that um, we have to behave with integrity, with respect, with responsibility, accountability, and ethically. And we aim to do that all the time. Of course, when you're in a position of power as I, Sometimes people perceive me to be, which I'm not. You know, sometimes you come across people who might, particularly with social media, uh, say things about you that are absolutely, completely, patently untrue, and they hurt. But that's the unfortunate price you pay. It affects, obviously, because, you know, your children are on social media. So it can actually affect a lot of us. So that creates a lot of... Um, uh, uh, you know, it challenges your leadership, but in, in some ways it makes you uh, makes you up your game. So in terms of, I think, to be a good leader, I think you should be compassionate, you should be caring, you should have be open, transparent, you, have, you should have candorship, uh, and you should have that um, expertise. You should have, I think you should command uh, a bit of respect because of what you are as a doctor as well. So Many medical directors, as you're aware, including myself, when I was medical director, we continued to do clinical work because we felt that that gave us uh, legitimate, um, uh, uh, legitimate, if you like, uh, respect from the profession. So I think that's what I would say about leadership. And of course, you know, some of the some of the issues that will come up, I'm sure, over the course of time, are issues to do with how we've coped during COVID. COVID has really tested us. We've done a huge amount of work, uh, BAPIO, with other organizations, with the Association of Pakistani Physicians of Northern Europe, Association of Pakistani uh, uh, Physicians and Surgeons, Association UK. Uh, we've done some work with the Egyptian Medical Association as well, with the BMA, uh, and many other organizations. So, uh, and continue to do that work. So uh, what COVID has taught me is that uh, we need to all be able to club together in order to uh, fight what are uh, the structural racisms within the NHS. So I think I'll end there, if you don't mind, Mehran, and, and then we can have a more uh, detailed discussion. Yeah, no, fantastic. Thank you, JS. Um, you've obviously raised lots of lots of areas for further discussion um you know leaders can't be leaders without followers uh, and you know you have to have those necessary skills and throughout the course of the the next hour we'll certainly talk of how to develop those and and the challenges that leaders face so um without further ado i'd like to uh, introduce our next guest Fazana hussein so she's kindly made it in 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 time uh, so thank you again Fazana. um so she's, she's a GP who lives and works in uh, New York East London. Um, she's also the principal GP at the Project Surgery and has been doing so for nearly two decades uh, with a list of about 5,000 patients. Uh, she's a mom of two teenagers, but clearly her role is that of co-chair of the NHS uh, Confederation PCN Network. I'm not knocking your, um, your mother status there, but clearly, you know, being GP of the year, um, gives you a certain platform uh, and we'd love to hear more about your philosophy uh, and further insight into leadership. So over to you, Fasana. Thank you so much for inviting me. Thank you. And, I, and I'm sorry I'm a bit late. I was just challenging my 
own leadership skills, got invited to um, a ministerial meeting, which is one of my first. So, um, so um, that was interesting. Um, so thank you for letting me speak about uh, my leadership journey. And I, I guess the first thing to say is, um, I never really thought of myself as, as a leader. Um, this is my 20th year as a GP. And ever since I went to medical school uh, and I got to talk to my first patient. Um, I graduated in 1997, so it was back in the day where you didn't see a patient until your third year. I was doing all the book work and not really enjoying it. And then I got to see a patient. I thought, I really like this. And I thought, you know, I want to be a GP. And that's what I wanted to do. Um, and then um, I, I, I trained in Wales, um, in, in Cardiff, the University of Wales, and then um, uh, I got married to somebody in London, as an arranged marriage, so I moved to London, and um, I uh, got what we used to call our house job here, and um, ended up in somewhere called Newham, which I had never ever heard of, and um, it, it wasn't particularly green or leafy as I had imagined I would live in, and it, it had a lot of graffiti, and what I realized within my probably first six months of working as a junior doctor in Newham was how grateful the patients were for anything we did. Anybody who knows Newham will know we're quite financially deprived, but really rich in culture. We've got over 200 languages spoken. And I thought, um, I quite like this. So it, it's not the green leafy area that I thought I, I would live in, but I'm quite enjoying this. And um, that was 1998 and here I am still in Newham and um, so I wanted to make a change and as I trained on the Newham GP scheme and then became a GP partner it was very early on I realized that there's a lot of good work I could do in my consulting room and I believe we do do as all doctors and, and all health professionals we do but there was lots of stuff I couldn't do, um, not because I was a bad GP, but because systems weren't allowing it the way we were set up as an NHS, the way primary care was set up. Um, so um, I did a few roles and I was um, um, uh, married to uh, quite a, a busy surgeon. So I had my home commitments as well and uh, had two young children and one of the things that I love about being a GP is that actually there's so many things you can do in that role so I became a GP appraiser and that gave me a lot of flexibility so I went into medical education and that gave me a lot of flexibility I could do those appraisals in my own time you know once the kids had gone to bed um, and then as the children got older, as they inevitably do, I had a, a little bit more time and flexibility um, to, to do other things I wanted to. And uh, in 2016, I joined um, what's called a GP Federation. So GP Federations are sort of um, umbrella organisations that represent uh, GP practices in the borough to give GPs a bit more of a voice. And um, I quite enjoyed that role as a director. Um, and then these things called primary care networks were born in, in, in 2019. And I was quite interested in them because I thought, well, it's great me seeing a patient with asthma and saying, yeah, 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 take your inhalers. But actually when she says that it's because I've got damp in my flat and that's why not me, but my little one's got asthma and that's why my little one's not going to school and actually I'm a single parent. I thought, well, I'm not really sure that my inhalers are going to do everything that we need to do for you. How do we think about helping you with your housing needs and helping you get back into work and help you with your childcare needs and help get your little one into school so that they've got better chances? And this is where I was really interested in the idea of primary care networks because primary care networks are a grouping of general practices, but also we want to work with our local authority, um, our hospitals, uh, our, our, our councils, but most importantly, our communities. Um, and then of course, COVID hit and the whole world changed, didn't it? And I can honestly tell you, I don't think I have ever worked as hard as I have for the last 12 months, exactly 12 months actually, I don't think I have enjoyed my work as much as I have for the last 12 months and I don't think I have ever found so much meaning in my work 
in the last 12 months. And my uh, great thing that I'm over the moon about is the way primary care has delivered COVID vaccination and been a great part of the COVID vaccination. There'll be 25 million people in this country are vaccinated. Um, so for me, it was, um, why did I want to do this? Whether I call it leadership or not, I wanted to make a positive change um, for people I was seeing inside and outside the consulting room. How did I do it? I was quite fortunate that I was in a job that gave me the flexibility to evolve as I was evolving. So when my children were younger, I needed more flexibility. I did want to pick my kids up from the primary school gate every day. My job allowed me to do that as a GP partner then I got more involved in sort of system leadership level roles. And now my 17 and 18 year old don't really want to see my face. They just want a bit of food and a bit of money. And as long as they've got food and money, I can pretty much do what I want. So I've got a bit more time to do other roles. Um, I think having some role models has been great. And, um, you know, that corny thing, they say you can't be what you can't. See. So having people like Nikki Kanani, who is a fantastic woman, who is our director of primary care, I think, gosh, if she can do it, why can't I do this as a BAME woman? Um, and so having some role models, learning from others. I'm really gr grateful that I've got some fantastic role models. Um, uh, I got into the primary care network things by the primary care home, an organization called the NAPC, the National Association of Primary Care, and people, GPs like uh, James Kingsland, Nav Chana still continue to help me and, and informally mentor me if I, if I need anything. And um, I think finally, just learning from what hasn't worked well. So uh, I think the only tip I would give any, uh, I think we can all be leaders. You can, um, I think anybody that, that runs a household is a leader. <laughs> it, it's all the same skills that you need um, as long as you, you want to make a change. And uh, just don't think of anything as a failure. I've done loads of things that, you know, in my own practice as a partner. And I think, oh, that didn't go very well, but that's okay. Now I can learn from it. So it's about learning from what things don't go well as well and not being too worried about it and just think what we can do differently and ask people for help. You know, I, I'm so grateful that um, people like yourself reach out to me uh, on Twitter and say, you know, do you want to come and do this webinar? So it, it's really lovely having that support and that help. So I'd say my three tips are don't be afraid. You know, you can't go wrong with it. You're only trying to make an improvement. Find your passion. Do what you want to do. I really like being a GP. And um, don't think of anything as a failure. Just think of it as a learning. And if something went well, do more of it. Uh, I think it's probably as simple as that, really. So it seems to work for me. That's great. Thank you for that. Um, I, I wholeheartedly agree that, you know, leadership does begin at home. Um, and, um, and you've raised lots of issues, um, lots of areas of the discussion with regards to what COVID-19 has brought, um, the strengths as well as the challenges, not just for, for leaders within teams, but also just the teams in general. Um, so we'll hopefully try and unpick that in, in the, uh, in the latter kind of 40 minutes of, uh, of our webinar. Um, so our third guest, third and final guest I'd like to introduce is Dr. Anil Jain. Uh, I think he's kindly made a presentation, so I'll, I'll let him start to share those slides. Um, so so he's, he's a Nye Bevan graduate, so, which means that it's, um, he's got executive healthcare leadership, but he's um, also a senior BAME influencer at the NHS Leadership Academy, uh, as well as UPNA NHS. Uh, he's also a member of the BMA UK Council, the UK Consultants Committee, and Equality, Diversity and Inclusion Advisory Group. So certainly we'll probably be talking a little bit more about what those terms mean and what do we need to be aware of. Um, he has numerous hats. He was also the founding chair of the Asian Breast Cancer Support Group. Um, but in addition to that, he, he works as a consultant radiologist. So, so over to you, Dr. Jane. Thank you. Uh, let me just... Uh start the slideshow uh, from the beginning. Okay, um, thank you uh, Fahim and Meheran for inviting me. And what I thought uh, I will do is, uh, I will just like JS, you know, uh, set out my leadership journey, explain some differences between management learning and uh, leadership, the difference between management leadership uh, at various stages of my career. And, uh, and what Farzana mentioned about lifelong learning, I will mention that also. 
then I will include uh, the influence that learning has had on my career trajectory. And then I, in the final part, I will include uh, some of my work at the British Medical Association, which really has taken shape as JS mentioned, you know, various organizations has done a lot of, and, uh, and I think my work, uh, you know, I think working from home during this time has largely been a lot of BMA work actually. So um, uh, now, uh, I mean, I, I started as a uh, radiology trainee. Uh, I did, uh, in 1989, I started as a radiology trainee in Glasgow, and uh, then I became a senior registrar. In those days, you had a, a registrar and the senior registrar post. I became a senior registrar in uh, January 1993, and uh, in those days, uh, senior registrar were uh, more or less uh, you know, approaching consultant appointment and you were expected to do management course. So I did a five, five days um, management trainee course um, in Manchester followed by it was a, some sort of like a certificate course, you know, almost lasted for nine months. You know. And the, the thing which I least like in that was the theory, a you know, lot of theoretical emphasis, Charles and his book on, uh, you know, uh, management and a uh, lot of leadership style, you know, management style. So it was largely focused on management, you know, and I think a um, lot of theoretical teaching exam as well, you know, uh, which I detested completely, you know, but uh, uh, here we are, you know, which was formally assessed, you know, and I just barely passed that, you know, I have to say, you know. So, uh, then I became a, a consultant in uh, radiologist in 1990. Four, you know, November 1994. And in those days, you know, I think uh, the medical director was, uh, I think she was uh, very proactive and uh, she organized some uh, seminars for consultants uh, in the evening. But most of them were in house uh, exec and non exec giving talks. And uh, so, for fairly low key affair, uh, quite a uh, sort of tribal place, uh, you know, a lot of, uh, I would say uh, in those days, there were only few BME consultants uh, at the trust. Uh, so the landscape was very different, you know. So you, you were lucky if you were just visible. And uh, following that, I did a, uh, um, it was an LLM course in medical law, which I did from University of Northumbria at Newcastle. And it took, quite some time to pass it actually. Uh, and again, there were, uh, there were uh, assignments, there were theoretical teaching, there were uh, weekend, and I used to go to Northumbria at Newcastle on Saturday for whole day teaching. And one thing I realized was, uh, and on reflecting that lawyers teaching is very similar to doctors. The only difference is that we look about uh, medical cases, uh, what happened previously uh, and uh, the evidence relating to that. While lawyers look at casework, you know, so they look at casework, the cases that have happened before. And that is what really determine the judgment in, in most of the cases. So the judges tend to follow you know, the judgment that has taken place before. And uh, the superior court have uh, you know, a deference in respect to judges. Like if Supreme Court passed some judgment, so that will stay, you know, until uh, another case at Supreme Court overrules that. So that is what how the legal system works, which was very interesting. A lot of learning in relation to informed consent, the Wolf reform uh, in uh, litigation, and obviously employment law and discrimination. So I think quite an extensive learning, uh, and I quite like that. I, I think I mentioned uh, uh, that there is. Uh, quite a bit of focus in the NHS on uh, management uh, learning, you know, and which I had as a uh, senior registrar and as a consultant, uh, and uh, which is largely focused on um, planning and budgeting, uh, established agenda, set timetables. So sort of thing, you know, which uh, I'm sure GP colleagues, will agree, GP colleagues also do that organizing, staffing, if you are a GP partner, you have to do all those things, uh, which are a uh, lot of things, quite cumbersome things, but 
essentially, so management is essentially, uh, you know, running the service, running the business, and uh, uh, controlling and problem solving, which are day-to-day -day problems, taking corrective action. As compared to that leadership, leadership is uh, uh, change and movement, very different from management. And I think that is, uh, if our listeners can understand that there is a clearly difference between that and uh, the leadership very much focused in uh, vision, you know, creating a vision, clarifying the big picture, uh, setting the strategy, aligning people, uh, communicate goal. And that's why chief executive, you know, you see they would have a blog, a weekly blog or weekly newsletter. And they, at that stage, they are very much leaders, you know, rather than managers. They see commitment, build team and coalition, and obviously, motivating and inspiring. So they have to lead by example. You know, uh, if the chief executive doesn't work hard, you know, the organization will fall apart. So they have, uh, so that's, uh, I think I would say to our listeners, you know, that uh, try to sort of like understand the perspective between uh, uh, management and leadership. You know, and I think for a lot of our BME colleagues, this is very important. You know, we perhaps do a lot of, uh, emphasis on management training, you know, but less on leadership. And I will come to that in more detail in a short while. I think as Farzana mentioned and JS mentioned, uh, there is ongoing learning. And if you uh, were appointed a consultant in 1994, you know, so I've been a consultant now for uh, 27 years. You know, and, uh, and uh, so each stage uh, as a consultant, as a clinical director, I had learning then part of trust management board. So a lot of learning as part of that. Uh, then I became my trust medical staff governor in 2006. And that was a different kind of learning you know, because uh, it is like working with uh, lay staff governors, lay, lay uh, public governors, which were I think 38 governors in total coming from all sorts of background. So learning with them, working with the uh, the staff governors and then holding the board to account. That was really very challenging. But I mean, I thought that was quite a significant learning. And the most important learning in that was how to work with members of public. You know, and, and, and that perspective I thought was very important. Then in uh, 2011, uh, after a uh, lot of breast cancer research, I founded the Asian Breast Cancer Support Group, which is still running virtually uh, and, uh, and to uh, improve support for Asian women who develop breast cancer. I also uh, uh, develop a cross-cultural communication skills training lead and, and JS has been to some of the events. Thankfully, JS and Kalash, you know, uh, came to a number of events. Uh, subsequently, as my career progress, uh, uh, university and research loads, I've been a um, honorary professor at Salford University and uh, uh, honorary senior lecturer at Manchester University. And uh, currently I'm also academic advisor for medical students and education supervisor for SPRs. And in 2004, uh, my career took slightly different, uh, you know, that I got involved in the BMA leadership. Uh, and I started with the uh, clinical medical director subcommittee. Uh, and one of the things in the BM is very, very hard to get in, you know, and then after getting in, how do you stay? You know, so some of the tips will follow. And, and I think Jess has, has been my guru in that respect. You know. And I will tell you because uh, in 2010, uh, I remember going to one of the evening meetings with Jess was chairing, you know, and Jess said, you know, there is election here. Anil, if you put your name for this one, you will get elected. And I put my name for deputy chair of Northwest Region Council. And I was JS deputy for six years, six years. So, and, and subsequently I'll tell you more about the BMA work in a, in a, in a minute. Now in 2015, uh, the NHS Leadership Academy was changing quite a lot. They, a lot of focus on inclusive leadership. And I joined one of their stepping up program, uh, which is uh, for BME uh, healthcare professionals uh, from diverse background, uh, multi-professional, you know, not focused just on doctors, you know, and I think, and that is one aspect uh, of learning, you know, we have to take in that it is uh, NHS multi-professional, you know, we can't, we can't just uh, be in our cocoon, you know, we have to learn from others as well. 
Then in 2000, uh, 2015, you know, after doing the stepping up program, uh, I got a place in the uh, you know, high flyer nine by one graduation program uh, at NHS Leadership Academy and Executive Healthcare Leadership. And when I wrote to my HR director, you know, she said, Anil, uh, these programs are for uh, leaders who are already established, you know, not for aspiring leaders. So if you want to join, you can join, but you will have to do that in your study leave. And, and I took up uh, that offer, you know, I said, okay, I will exhaust my study leave, but I, I will do this program. So I went for the, the leadership program, which I graduated in 2007. 2017. And I think this uh, was quite a turning point. And I say uh, a lot of listeners, I would emphasize that uh, look outside your trust, you know, don't just focus on the trust for all the learning or from the colleges. Look at uh, like uh, NHS uh, Leadership Academy or Faculty of Medical Leadership, you know, for some of the, or King's Fund, you know, for some, some of the extra learning. So in, in my case, you know, it developed my skills, knowledge, attitude, behavior, uh, quite a lot, uh, critical awareness, critical reflection, uh, how to uh, constructive challenge in a board setting, in a committee work, because a lot of my work is committee work. In a committee work, uh, you should, uh, you know, you should be able to constructive challenge, but not breaking, uh, you know, uh, uh, keeping a decorum and, and keeping the, you know, not leading to, uh, complete dissension, you want to maintain harmony, you know, to be able to, uh, still able to talk to the person at lunchtime. So I think, uh, and I learned quite a lot of uh, how we can construct a challenge uh, in a board setting. So that was my learning from that. Uh, and obviously emotional intelligence, you know, that's another thing which is, uh, you will hear quite a lot uh, that uh, uh, Goldman's uh, model of, uh, uh, learning uh, emotional intelligence, you know, which is important because you need to be aware you know, what is happening around. A lot of time, uh, there are good things happening around you, but a lot of time there are bad things happening around you. So you need to protect yourself from both good things, uh, you know, enjoy the good things, but protect yourself from bad things. And emotional intelligence, I would suggest that uh, if your readers want to, uh, viewers want to read, you know, Daniel Goldman, uh, a book on emotional intelligence, you know, that is something uh, you need to lead, read. And other thing is that uh, how uh, there is a lot of change happening within the NHS. And viewers need to remember, you know, that achieving a change is the most difficult part of leadership. You know? and, and, and there are a quarter model of eight steps, you know, um, in which uh, various steps are outlined. So those are the sort of things you, know, you learn during this uh, leadership journey, which is very important. And I think uh, next slide, uh, you know, I got involved in a lot of international medical graduate uh, issues, uh, which uh, I've been involved for some time because myself being an IMG uh, and uh, uh, sharing their stories, fight for the issues that matter most to them. And JS kindly also mentioned some of the work, you know, uh, BMA is doing jointly with other organizations, BAPU and BIDA. And, uh, and I wrote a number of blogs, you know, uh, during pandemic on risk assessment, uh, on uh, how IMG doctors can protect themselves, a lot of issues on uh, vaccine vaccination in the BME doctors. So those issues I have highlighted. Um, and I think- uh, And it will probably uh, come to the end of your time. Yeah, okay, yeah, I will, I will, yeah, quickly. Uh, and valuing the contribution of IMG doctors, you know, that's really very important, you know, because you won't believe it in 2019, there were more international medical graduates you know, than local graduates. So, uh, and, and the issues are quite real, you know, uh, and some of the issues were in your questions also, I'm sure you will ask in a short while. And I think we set up a IMG screening group at the BMA and IMG champions group and JS is one of the champions, you know, and I think these slides will be available to you. You can look at that and see what are our objectives, you know, and get involved into the IMG steering group. Uh, this is really basically bringing them into uh, uh, into fold and uh, become part of the BMA and uh, and uh, get the benefits uh, that other doctors are getting. And, and and I think demand their fair share. If they're doing so much work, you know, the NHS should value them. 
And I think as Jace mentioned, you know, this slide, you know, uh, really changed the perspective quite a lot uh, last, uh, after the first year pandemic, uh, 35 doctors, 90% uh, BME doctors, and, and I keep a, you know, a list of all the BME doctors, who have, all the doctors who died and in my, this, there are over 55 doctors at the moment, and 80% of those doctors are BME. A lot of them are international medical graduates. So uh, a very sad, poignant uh, time that we have gone through. And this led to the work, you know, I did with uh, Chand uh, in the last 10 months or so, set it, setting up the BMA National Band Member Forum and required a lot of leadership. All the skills that I acquired, you know, they were tested in that, you know. And you can read into the later on, I will share the slides um, and you can see that uh, the members benefit, PMA benefit and communities benefit. And then obviously the uh, BME regional member networks, you know, that's another thing, you know, 10 regional networks and Fahim is member of the Northwest network. So you can look at that also. And uh, in the next slide, uh, you got the details of all the regional coordinators. So you can just email the coordinator if you are a BME member to become part of the network. So uh, thank you. Thank you, Fahim. And the apologies. Slide maybe overran a little bit, but uh, no, it's fine. I, I think it's you. a good point to say, yeah, I am a BMA member as well. So uh, yes. in case I go easy on you, Anil, tonight. <laughs> yeah, thank you, thank you. Um, I want to go to JS first, if I may. Um, JS, you may, um, uh, we've got questions coming in that we need to go through. There was something interesting you said in uh, your, your speech, and you were mentioning about leaders being either born or coming into evolving. And that's an interesting concept. Um, what do you think of different leadership styles and actually the leadership courses in that sense? Can you give the audience a bit of an insight? Have you found, for instance, any leadership courses useful or, or is it more of an inbuilt thing that you've learned on the job? You just, yeah. I'm on mute, sorry, I was on mute. Well, that's leadership, isn't it? You don't even know that you're muted. Uh, but uh, I, I actually enjoyed Farzana's uh, talk and Anil's talk very much, to be truthful. Uh, you know, I think um, it's not easy, particularly at the moment when you look at uh, BME people. You know, what, what I would say just before I come to, to answer this question for him is, when I, so we, we talk to a lot of the reporters as well. We have a consortium of 38 BME uh, organizations that have come together during COVID. These are all the top organizations in the country. They are entirely BME in order to try and uh, tackle the problem of structural racism because it's going to stay here for a long time. Um, and I, you know, and I, as I reflect on this, I think it's very important for us to be together. I was. Um, I was uh, representing BME people. I have, a, I have a very strong opposition to prevent, for instance, which is a program, as you're aware, which I've openly declared as being racist. And I challenged the chief constable of Leicester who brought in prevent. So I met with the Department of Health to talk about prevent. And I told them exactly that, uh, that look, this is a program that is aimed at one faith, the Muslim faith, and uh, really, you're better looking at all of that and putting everything in safeguarding rather than doing what you are doing because you want to win hearts and minds as well as keep the public safe and the individual uh, not to be penalized or communities. So I think uh, in terms of leadership, I don't know, you know. I think what happens to my mind, I'll tell you for him, but the honest truth is, as I was saying, when I was a, when I was a little kid growing up in Tanzania, I wouldn't have thought that I would be here today. I would not have thought that I would have been given the platform in many places that I have. I like to think that people think that I try and approach things with the eye of diversity, equality, and inclusivity. And I've always been, a, I, I'm, I'm otherwise pretty, although I'm Punjabi by blood, but I tend to be a bit cool as well, calm, even during rocky waters. As Susan will know, Susan's here. Susan used to be in my it, 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 Susan used to be an uh, HR person who I worked very closely at my trust when Mehran was a junior doctor. I think that um, the most important thing to me for him was modeling. My role models informed what I am today, is what I would say. But too many of them 
Uh, Myron could have been my role model. Anil could have been my role model. They don't <laughs> always have to be of your equal seniority or indeed even senior to you. You know, you learn something from everybody. So that's what I would say. Thank you, um, Jess. Fazana, I'd like to come to you next. Uh, thank you for taking the invitation. And uh, I know you, you herald from Preston, so I know a little bit about you. Like myself, you went to Preston College, so obviously I know all of these places. And it's really good because even though you went to the big smoke of London to remember your roots, so I really appreciate that, Fazana, because you've been doing a lot of work with uh, Lancashire, so I appreciate that. My question to you is um, obviously to do with intersectionality uh, and diversity. Obviously, you know, you're, you're outwardly visibly Muslim. Uh, you're obviously female, as you mentioned, one of your role models, Nikki Kanani. Um, so tell us your journey in that sense. Has that been a hurdle or something that you've overcome or what does it mean? Because I'm sure many people here are, are here because of the post and, and knowing that you are coming on tonight and uh, you're a role model to many of them, female and non-female GPs here tonight. So what would you say about intersectionality and trying to overcome obstacles to get a leadership position? So I would say, Fahim, I have been really fortunate. I have not um, found that either my religion or my gender or my race has obstructed me with anything I want to do. That might be because I'm in primary care. Um, you know, we, we do know, don't we, that there is quite a lot of uh, very explicit uh, racism in, in acute trust. And we also know um, because um, hospitals have... Um, reporting mechanisms on this of course which we don't at the moment in primary care so whether we have racism in primary care or not we don't actually know whereas hospitals have the res reporting um, and um, we know for example in London that uh, again going back to Covid we know that there's been a disproportionate amount of uh, BME deaths in the health workers you know we've got more than 45 percent of our health workers in London are BAME and in fact um, the NHS Confederation has set up a whole race and health observatory to be looking at, at, at these things. Um, personally, I have to say, I think I'm really blessed. Uh, I, I haven't been. Um, I think the tip I would give is um, find people that's like, that are like you. So I'm just reflecting on the meeting that I was just in. You know, I'm still quite nervous about seeing ministers. I've only done a few, you know, of these meetings. And she was lovely and really listening. Uh, but there were, um, there was... Uh, three other BME women uh, and there were some um, Caucasian gentlemen who, who were uh, about 10 years older than us. I'm in my late 40s and we're just different. There's no, there, there's nothing wrong with each, but we're very different. We approach differently. We speak differently. We may think differently. And I think it's just really important to understand that. That, that we are different and that's why diversity and inclusivity is so important. We know, for example, that on boards, the AME men and women are still highly underrepresented. The AME women are very underrepresented. And um, it, the importance for me about diversity and inclusion is because I will be looking at the world through one lens, but actually the Caucasian gentleman will be looking at it through another lens and it's only together that we'll get the whole picture. Um, so for me, that's really important. Um, I think I, I, I am blessed that I haven't had any personal, um, I can't think of any personal um, uh, racism I've faced. In fact, if anything, to be absolutely truthful, I have faced quite a lot of sexism from Asian gentlemen colleagues who have said to me, oh, but you don't want to go for that chair position because you're a really busy mum and you're running your own practice and you've got a husband to feed. And while it's funny, I wouldn't say that to a gentleman. So I think, you know, racism cuts amongst BAME communities as well. And I think that's important to remember, uh, you know, as well, because I don't think they'd be saying that to a Caucasian woman. And I think just because I happen to run a household and do my work, um, that's up to me to organize. It's not for somebody else to, to um, challenge me on that. Uh, but I would say, if you really want to do something, find your tribe. Um, so I, I found allies in white men, I found allies in, um, you know, Asian women like Nani, but the, it's, I think, what, what you want to do, and I would encourage anybody not to let your race or your religion or your gender stand in the way, and if you think something's wrong, say so. So um, I 
I wanted to pray and prayer time was at uh, sunset for me today and we were in the middle of the ministerial meeting and I didn't want to miss it and I just put in the chat box please can you excuse me for five minutes I just want to and everybody said that's fine I think 10 years ago I wouldn't have had the confidence to do that that's a confidence that's come with uh, an old uh, an older age and and I think also the I share that because I think it's about being confident in who you are and what you're going to do and what you want to do. Because actually missing five minutes of that appointment, of that meeting didn't matter to us, but it was something that was very important to me. Um, so um, I think ask, be brave. They can only say no. Really good. Um, there's a lot there for, uh, to mull over and think about. Thanks, Fazana. Anil, uh, we've had a question come in. Um, I think you're the right person, so I'll ask you and then uh, see what you make of it. Do you have any thoughts about the majority of leadership opportunities being unpaid, uh, for instance, the BMA and RCGP, etc.? How can we encourage those from diverse backgrounds who want to get involved but feel unable to because of this? I guess um, the crux of the question, Anil, is asking about remuneration for leadership yes. positions, and sometimes it's not always there on the plate, money yes. for your time. Um, so can you give us a bit, a bit of thoughts about that? I mean, I think, uh, in a sense, uh, uh, that is a perception, you know, uh, which our doctors have. Uh, if you see trust level leadership role, uh, they have a program activity attached to them. Uh, clinical director, medical director, associate medical director, all the roles, tutors, all the roles have something attached to them. Similarly, in general practice, you know, if you do LMC chair, CCG member chair, uh, all the roles are paid you. In the BMA, if you get involved, uh, then uh, the time off uh, uh, can be negotiated as part of the trade union activity because what you are doing is representing your uh, members you know who are bma members and uh, and uh, uh, and of course if you are very very senior you know like uh, chang nakpol you know then the bma will pay your practice you know to release you for 3 days plus uh, addition time you know so uh, so i think the higher you go in the bma the more uh, support you get so i think uh, what i would say to our uh, doctors is that uh, uh, don't always uh, look for immediate gain. You know, the gain could be, you know, incremental gain. Gain comes later on. You know. If you see some of the colleagues who have taken uh, NHS uh, medical director fellows role or uh, uh, NHS uh, uh, clinical director role, they only get, uh, uh, essentially, they get time off. You know. They get uh, their uh, PAs, they, they get seconded from the, their trust to do the NHS England role. But it pays them later on in form of clinical excellence award, in the form of uh, other benefits they get. You know. So I think it is a investment for future. You know. So leadership is not for immediate gain. You know. If you want immediate gain, then I would rather open a shop you know, and and start selling things, and I can make money much faster. You know, and JS would agree. You know that lot of doctors in India. You know, for example, uh, they're earning far more than what we earn here because, uh, you know, they are in business. And similarly, I think you must have seen that headline in Daily Express, a GP earning 700,000 pounds per year. 700,000 pounds per year. And I, I, I said to uh, Gaurav Gupta that there must be one zero extra, you know, by mistake. <laughs> no, that, that GP is earning 700,000 pounds. So I think, <laughs> so because he's running a business, he's got 35 practices, you know, so he's, is a, and there are examples in Northwest, you know. I wouldn't name them, you know, but there are examples, you know. You who are, it down for us, Adil. <laughs> <laughs> who are super rich. 700,000, you know, 10 year salary. You know. <laughs> Can someone give me that GP's name? I want him to be or her to be my friend. <laughs> yeah, we'll find it for you, Farzana. We'll find it for you. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you, Anil. Um, I guess I'm going to come to you, JS. As, as chairman of BAPIO, you've probably over the years seen a great deal of diversity in, in terms of the membership. How have you tried to ensure that engagement from both, I guess, the, the, the louder sections within the membership as well as the quieter sections to ensure that the culture and the values 
as well as opportunities exist, whether they're from different ethnicities or religious backgrounds or sexuality or gender. How have you tried to ensure that Bafio is responsive um, and continue to develop over, over the years? Yeah, of course. So, you know, in any, in any organization, you have to be both um, internally introspective as well as external facing, and you have to be able to cope with, uh, particularly as the size of organizations grow and the pressure of everything. So, uh, you know, we, we, uh, the executive committee are absolutely charged with the responsibility of ensuring that we are inclusive, and that we have equality, we have diversity, we have people in responsible positions as well, that we look at that as well. So it's a continually evolving. Papi has been around for 25 years. I've been the chair since 1985, January or February. So it's a continuing, continuously evolving, evolving uh, association. Uh, well, lots, of, lots to learn. I mean, I was a director and council member at the BMA. BMA, was, BMA has been around for 190 years, and it's only very recently that there has been better diversity, thanks to the efforts of people like Anil, who's, um, who's really helped to run the uh, BMA organ, uh, uh, forum, but also an, uh, 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 there's an organization called APNA NHS, which has a lot of uh, diversity and inclusivity in that. So, and Anil is... Uh, Anil is a driving force in that as well. So yeah, so you learn from other organizations as well, Mehran. We are always continuously looking at these issues because we can't accuse others of being uh, structurally racist in the NHS and ourselves not to look at ourselves. Yeah, no, having said that, Having said that, people will make all sorts of cl false claims, particularly as I was mentioning before, on social media, which are patently untrue. But, uh, you know, what do I do? I just get on and do my job. You lose a, you lose a few hours sleep sometimes because you're only human, but we always could do more. Yeah, no, thank you for that, JS. And obviously, you know, in terms of segments of the, of the groups, if there's complaints, obviously there's a process in place, but it's, it's as you said, it's evolving field. And we've talked a lot about diversity, inclusivity, but I guess the other term I'm really keen to hear is about justice. Um, uh, so I think that's that's really important. And I guess following that, Fazan, I was going to come to you about bullying specifically. Um, COVID-19, COVID I guess even before COVID, um, the UK is one of the few countries where um, the actual the number of doctors per 100,000 people is actually very low. Um, so there are junior doctors who feel under pressure, who feel bullied or harassed. Um, what do we do as leaders to ensure that their needs are met, and, um, and especially during times like this? Very good question. I was just um, reflecting on what JS was saying that, um, you know, it could be also that someone like me hasn't faced as much racism because of all the work that people like Anil and JS have been doing. I mean, JS organized, started this in 1985 when I was 12. And it's just something to remember that this is a, a journey I was having, that, but, but that perhaps people like me and hopefully generations <laughs> below me won't uh, because of the work that all that work that has gone in, you know, like, uh, you know, a lot of people have been saying, have, haven't they, that, um, you know, Rosa Parks started the work in America. That's why now we have a, a female vice president who is half Indian, half, half, half um, African. So um, you've asked a really hard question um, and I'm not sure you know, that there is one answer, but I think the first thing is to recognize it, that it is happening and COVID has certainly uh, found this, hasn't it? That BAME people have been disproportionately affected and actually gave the ultimate sacrifice. They died because of COVID. Did they have it, the right amount of PPE, uh, the personal protective equipment? I know the BMA did a lot of work to try and help that when COVID first arrived. Um, you know, people were, were told, no, you, you can't, 
wear the extra protective things. You know, they got sent home and BAME people suffered more because A, they're in a lot of the frontline jobs and not just doctors. We're talking about the nurses and, and, and the midwives. And they didn't feel, you know, many of them felt that they wouldn't be able to talk to their senior managers about this. So I think number one is to recognise it, to call it out, and then actually to, to look at what is the extent of the problem and then say, well, you know, your gender, the colour of your skin or the religious practices that you choose or not choose to practice should not determine what you want to do and what job you want to do or how you want to live, actually. Yeah, no, uh, thank you for that, Fazana. Uh, very nicely put. Um, I'm going to come to you, Anil, and then I think Fahim may have one or two questions. And I'm, I am mindful of time because um, Fahim also needs to finish. Because so, like two a... minutes extra, you know, that is fine, you know, because we started late. So it's good to okay. have questions asked. Yeah, go ahead. Fantastic. So, so I guess as as um, with your BMA hat, uh, as well as I guess your uh, radiology background, because you're a consultant within within your trust, um, the the recent NHS staff survey felt that more Black and minority ethnic staff in the NHS have faced discrimination, um, and they don't feel as though the opportunities are presented to them. So, I guess there seems to be some some disparity or some conflict. Uh, where people may be too late to the party or if they do want to join that party they don't get the opportunities to actually progress and be supported in a constructive way what what, what do you have to say about that I know I, I think uh, that is the crux of uh, issue you know you raise and Farzana mentioned that in London 45 percent doctors are BME and uh, nationally in England 44 percent doctors are BME and this is now across the board, not just SCA grade, you know, consultants are uh, in mental health trust, you know, in some trust, 70% doctors are BME. And, uh, and some other trust, you know, uh, like vegan trust, you know, it's more than 60% doctors are BME. And I think what has happened is that, uh, and I just go back to the question what Fahim asked, you know, to some extent, uh, we ourselves are also responsible, you know, that we were... Uh, we didn't take those issues seriously. We didn't call out those issues. When those things were happening, you know, we just uh, accepted that. You know, I think the generation before us, uh, a lot of them are international medical graduates. They simply focus in settling into the country, bringing a family. They didn't want to cause any dissension, you know. And now we got the younger generation like yourself, you know, uh, Fahim, second generation, Alia, born, brought up here, you know. You should be able to challenge the system. Uh, and my son, for example, who is a radiology training, and we should be able to uh, challenge challenge that uh, that sort of thing shouldn't take place. Now, other thing I would say is that uh, uh, I think uh, uh, BM, especially Asian, have a, a weakness that they don't get involved into things uh, where there is no money. And to be honest with you, the way there is no money, they don't get involved. And I think most of the trust have BME staff network. Uh, colleagues should get involved in that. They get traction into issue, into policy making. They can affect the strategy. We have uh, Prerna Isser as our chief uh, people's officer, heavily invested into uh, developing the BAM staff network. And similarly now, uh, I think uh, Mo Satar leads a primary care uh, BAM staff network. And in the BME now, we have set up the BAM members forum as well as networks, you know. So there is no reason for uh, BME doctors not to join those fora and network because you got a collective voice you know, as a single person. Um, and I think as Farzana mentioned, uh, the issue uh, which, uh, you know, I was greatly pained about was that at the BMA council, we don't have a single BME elected woman. You know? And I said, uh, that is not acceptable, you know. I would not uh, be happy with as a council member not having a single BME woman uh, who's elected. And I think so. BME is now looking at that issue, that how do we open it? And I know uh, Fahim will tell me, RCGP has done that. You know, they, they got six uh, council members, all of them are BME female. Now, other important thing is colleagues who get elected into those posts, it is vital they look after BME issues. 
they don't, they become, if they become self-protective, self-preservation, then I think, I don't think they're going to serve uh, the community which sends them. Because I think uh, that is really critical in my view that uh, we have good leadership skills, leaders who are able to challenge the system, leaders who uh, are representative rather than representing themselves, you know, they represent the constituents. Thank you. Excellent, Anil. Um, Jess, I'd like to come to you. Uh, yeah. I want to end on a positive note. <laughs> it's quite yeah. heavy, some of the topics we've been talking about the last uh, 10, 20 minutes. And obviously, the question I want to ask you, Jess, is really for Fazana and Anil as well. But you have the benefit of some more extra thinking time uh, for you two. Uh, Jess, uh, just really about positivity. It's um, what do you what are you most proud of, really? You, you do a lot of roles, a lot of leadership. We talked about BAPIO and things, but what do you see as your legacy uh, and something that you can hand over and actually that you can tell the audience? Or, I mean, uh, I'd really like to hear that, and so would the audience. Oh, I don't know if I... Oh, that's a really loaded... That's unfair. You know, 8 o'clock, you ask me a question so loaded. To be I'm truthful, glad you I'm, asked Jay's this question first. <laughs> I, I, I'm, yeah, I'm hoping that um, I mean there are very clever people I know who write their own obituaries. Uh, I shan't be writing mine uh, anytime soon. You'll be pleased to know for him. I think it's for other people to judge. I think what I think, what I have learned, probably as a psychiatrist, probably psychiatry has taught me a lot about emotional intelligence. It's not intelligence that matters, to be truthful, because you're all equally intelligent. Intelligent. The, the people who will separate and become something else are people with emotional intelligence, all of you included, by the way. So what am I, so my legacy, I don't know. Let somebody else write it for me. Uh, but actually I would say that um, we're all on a journey. This is going to be a pretty tortuous journey in the next few years. And we have to learn to live with each other. We have to be tolerant of one another. I'm very tolerant of people as, um, especially Susan will know, who was uh, in my HR department and she's lovely. It's great to see Susan, but uh, no, listen for him, ask the others and then I might think about it and, and come back to that. But, but okay, no, definitely. You can't come back, you, know, you got a chance. Yeah, I'll definitely come back to you for maybe a, a I'm not, I, <laughs> how, Yeah, how we'll, you, do, we'll yeah, do take I, two, when you and Mehran invite us again. <laughs> if you do. We haven't put you off, that's good. <laughs> Uh, no, not <laughs> can I ask you, uh, what do you see as your legacy? I mean, yeah, you, you're still thriving GP many years to go, but so far you've achieved so much. Uh, and uh, it's nearly every other day I see you in the media, you're obviously doing the work uh, with COVID vaccinations, ringing up people when they're not answering. Uh, obviously your work with Lancashire, Lancashire Radio and so on, GP of the year. I, I do feel like you're in the media a lot and that gives you a platform. So tell us what's your legacy and what do you hope other people can take uh, take out from that? So as um, Jay said, it's a hard question. I think I'm going to change the question if that's all right. I'm not sure what the legacy will be. Uh, I think there's probably three things that I feel quite proud of myself for um, that I will remember when, when, you know, when I'm older and lying in my bed and with my Zimmer frame. I think one will be that I wanted to be uh, a mum that was a very present mum that was always there to pick up my kids, do the homework with them and drop them off at school myself. And many, many working women and many, many GPs or female doctors find that really hard. And I'm really proud that I was able to, as a GP partner, had the flexibility to do that. And I think that's something I'm really pleased with that my work and my mum life, the two roles are really important to me, I, I managed to do. I think the second one, um, uh, seven years ago, as some people will know, uh, we were a two partner practice. I run a list of 5,000 and my GP partner committed suicide. Um, and it was in November and he had been my trainer. He'd been my senior partner, somebody I really looked up to, like an informal mentor as well as a friend. And it was November and our salary GP was on maternity leave. I was left just before a flu epidemic, because flu epidemic hit, holding 5,000 patients grieving. And I really wondered if I would be able to continue um, or whether I should just give it up and you know get another job and 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 just but the two reasons I didn't do that is because I knew my 5,000 patients would be dispersed 
um, and they uh, the community matters to me because these are very it's very financially deprived but very richly diverse and we're 74% BAME where I work in Newham and I thought that was important and I thought uh, you know my staff would lose their jobs so I'm really pleased that we went through that and I guess my legacy would be I hope that I hope in some way I've managed to make a bit of a difference with COVID. Um, the reason I have had more meaning and enjoyed my work so much in the last year, never been as knackered as I am, but but have enjoyed it and continue to have energy because, um, you know, I, I never thought and did any of us think we would live through a pandemic. I mean, again, in East London, I've got the Royal London just near me. 144 extra beds were open in January. Most of those ITU beds were filled with young BAME people. And I, I just felt, you know, thank God I have been given the privilege to be a GP. I might have been something else. Um, the fact that I am a doctor, I really felt quite deep down that I wanted to do something about that. And that's why the vaccination program has been really important to me because it's the BME people who are more at risk of dying and, and some of them are the ones that have less confidence in the vaccine, which is why I started ringing the patients. So I think those, those three things, I think, for me. Great. I'm sure there's many more, but very, very <laughs> modest of you to keep it to three. Um, Anil, um, your legacy and what you want us to take out, obviously, there's a wealth yes, of... Yes, I mean, I think uh, I would, uh, you know, take a little bit from JS, a little bit from Farzana, you know. I think uh, from Farzana, the COVID, uh, I think, uh, empowered and enabled me, you know, to speak out more at the BMA. Because prior to... Uh, the number of uh, colleagues that were dying from uh, COVID-19, I was probably less uh, sort of hesitant in the committees, you know, to raise BME issues. But when I saw that uh, our uh, BME doctors were dying in such large number, you know, I mean, I, I raised at every committee meeting, every committee meeting I went to, you know, whichever four I could use, I said that uh, BME doctors are dying. Uh, uh, Chand was very supportive of that. And we were able to, so I would consider uh, some of the changes I'm bringing in the BMA in relation to uh, the National BAM Forum, uh, the BAM Regional Networks and IMG Forum. You know, So these will be long lasting. You know. The one good thing in the BMA is once you set up something, it doesn't get <laughs> entangled. You know, it, stays, it, stay, it, takes, it takes ages to establish it, but once established, it stays on. So that is one uh, legacy I would say. Second thing I would say is, uh, which Farzana also hinted that, uh, why are we there? I mean, we are there to serve the communities, the population. Coming from the BME communities, I think it is absolutely vital that we understand that they are facing deep health inequalities. And I saw that in my work with the Asian women, you know, who were facing breast cancer, uh, scourge, you know, and, and increasing risk. And some of the support work that I have done and some of the work that I'm doing now with risk assessment of BAM colleagues and now some vaccination awareness, I feel that it is absolutely critical on us. You know, I mean, we think if we went to work and come back daily, you know, that we done our bit. No, we haven't because we are very fortunate, you know, we are very well aware. And in a hospital, you know, I give an example uh, for him that third of uh, BAME, BAME uh, healthcare professional still haven't accepted vaccination. So there is a big challenge, you know, and I think that is my biggest challenge, you know, how to persuade them that it is in their interest uh, until uh, everybody is protected, nobody is protected, you know. So that is, I feel, uh, uh, very important. Uh, uh, in relation to that. So I think uh, these would be, and, and obviously what Farzana mentioned about the uh, issue about BME woman, you know, that is uh, very dear to my wife is in the audience, you know, you know her and you've spoken to her. And I am one person, you know, who uh, helped her, you know, and, you know, pushed her for a variety of roles, you know, to LNC chair, to the colleague role, to trustee role. And, and I feel that all the husbands should do that you know, because it is, it is, it is. They should be duty bound, you know. To and I think uh, the the generation above me, you know, they're uh, even when wives were doctors, you know, they were just basically, uh, 
you know, the part-time work, they didn't have any leadership role. Husband carried most of the leadership role. And I feel that your generation, younger generation, you all need to ensure that uh, your partner, uh, spouse, you know, they get the leadership training and all the opportunities that come with it. That opportunity you need to make available. So I would feel that I need more work to, you know, do on that, but that will be another legacy I want to develop. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Anil. And I guess we're, we're probably at that point to, um, to try and bring the webinar to an end. Um, <clears throat> you know, we'd, we've actually done reasonably well con considering our previous experiences with webinars. But, um, but I just, again, I just want to really thank both Anil, uh, Fazana and JS for their uh, invaluable experience and reflections of, of leadership and of the current challenges. And of course, the guests that have continued to, to stay engaged in the whole conversation. Um, <clears throat> leadership is not something that will go away. It's vitally important, but I guess the key thing is develop yourself or develop someone else. And I think that's, that's, the, uh, that's the, uh, the message that at least I want someone to to take away from this discussion. Uh, we do have faith in medicine, um, you know, the, the very mutually dependent as well as independent. So we're gonna be talking about that on April the 7th at 7.30 PM. Um, but again, I just want to thank everyone for sharing their Wednesday evening.